Hey. <laughs> oh, I was muted. Hello, everybody. It's Teresa from Zonta. Hi, Teresa. Hey, Teresa. Hi, Teresa. Uh, hello. hello from Zonta. Hi, everybody. Hi, how you doing, Hi. Dorothy? Good. <clears throat> I'm a friend of Wimpe's. I don't, I don't, I don't know much about Zanta, but hi everybody. <laughs> hi, that's hi. okay. Hi. <laughs> yeah, that's welcome. Great. All are welcome. Hi, kiddo. Wimpe, hi, sweetie. <laughs> hey, buddy. Hanifa Barnes. Hey. Hi. hi. Can you guys hear me? Hi. You can hey. unmute yourself if you okay. want to say hello. <laughs> we can hear you. You hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Help. <laughs> can you hear me yes. yes oh good just making sure hi guys hi Anton. Uh, hi hello mike is that michael ellis my brother or another mike <sighs> i want to be like mike hey mike <laughs> <laughs> hello, this is a different mike i'm friends with Bay. Oh, hi. Oh, the Bimpe. Okay, go ahead, Bimpe. <laughs> Equals, I love it. <laughs> so, is there specific, um, anything specific I need to do or no? Who's, who's asking that? That's Queen. 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 Yeah, Queen, uh, Antoinette, what you should know is that Antoinette is going to introduce you when it's time. Okay. <laughs> and let's just wait. It's 2.02. We're just waiting. Let's just wait for a few more folks before we get started and uh, uh, give everybody instructions. So we'll, um, people are still joining. Great. Antoinette, oh, yes. Yeah. You, are you, I think maybe we might get started. We have a little bit of introductions to do sure. so people can join. So Christine, you want to start the recording? Yes, we're all set. Great. So hi, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to our very first Women at NJPAC at Home series uh, in partnership with the Zonta Club of Essex County. Uh, we are Delighted to have you with us today and um, delighted to partner um, in this creative idea with this incredible group of women. So, um, uh, you know, in these uncertain times, it's really amazing how we gather. And I think women's voices are even more important than ever uh, to and essential to our healing and uh, shining a light and highlighting the kinds of work that's happening in our community to do healing. Uh, so our trustee, um, Dr. Antoinette Ellis Williams, uh, suggested this partnership and this idea. Uh, we're delighted that it's a series. We're delighted that you're here with us today. Um, I want to just um, welcome you on behalf of women at NJPAC, on behalf of everybody at NJPAC, um, and thank you for, for joining us. Um, a couple of uh, uh, rules. Uh, we're going to keep everybody on mute during uh, the first part during the performances. Uh, and uh, we're ask, we'll ask that you use the chat function on Zoom to um, ask any questions and, we'll, and Antoinette will be uh, uh, leading a Q&A sec section um, after our performances. So, so with that, I'm delighted to um, introduce uh, Paulette Chapman, who is the president of Zonta, to give you a welcome. Thank Paulette. you, Sarah. Hi. Hi, welcome all. Zonta Club of Essex County is very proud to be partnering with women at NGPAC for this event. The Zonta Club of Essex County has been a well-known secret for 90 years, 
but I believe that that begins to end today. We are part of Zanta International, who has 29,000 members in 63 countries, all working together to improve the lives of women and girls through service and advocacy throughout the world. We are one of a few organizations who work with the United Nations as a non-governmental organization, NGO, focusing in on areas such as sustainable development as it relates to women empowerment, human trafficking, women's employment, human rights, gender pay gap, and much more. On a local level, we, uh, we are involved with the Safe House, the New Jersey Human Trafficking Coalition, our local shelters, our local food banks, and have been providing scholarships for most of our 90 years to young women who are going into college after high school. So uh, we, we're, we're really involved in the community. I'd like to introduce, introduce Antoinette Ellis Williams, a sister Zanchen and moderator for today's presentation. She and her committee, as you will see, have done a fabulous job in putting this together. Antoinette? You're on mute. Internet, unmute. Thank you all so much for this uh, amazing opportunity to work together and to um, talk about issues that I think are so important. Um, Paulette mentioned some really important things that Zanta uh, Club does. And I was looking at the calendar to see how long um, our household has been in confinement and we have been here for going on two months. Um, I work at New Jersey City University and our spring break started in March 6th. And so um, it's been a good time and it's been uh, nice to have the family home. However, under the best of circumstances, this is a difficult time. It's a very difficult time when we're talking about um, our health and talking about um, things that get us a little frightened. And so in thinking about and conceptualizing this program, we know that the voices of women and children um, sometimes get very muted in this time. Women are called upon most times, but not always, to now serve as homeschool teachers, to still work at home, to manage the household, to cook. Um, and we know that uh, that can be very, very stressful and difficult. Um, there's trauma, there's issues of abuse, there are triggers. And so we wanted to find a way to um, lift the uh, veil, if you will, and also to let people know you're not alone. We're all going through something. And, and to that end, um, you heard the name Safe House mentioned. And I wanted to invite the uh, coordinating coordinator at Safe House Darina Johnson to give you a welcome and say a little bit about uh, that great organization. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Hi, my name is Darina Johnson. I'm the program coordinator of the Safe House, which is a domestic violence program. We um, are a 24 hour facility. We provide shelter for victims of domestic violence. We also serve male victims. We can hold 51 individuals in our program. In the safe house, we have a 24 hour domestic violence hotline. We, we have a shelter. Um, we offer individual counseling and therapeutic sessions for program participants. Um, we have individual and group therapy and we also have offsite therapy through a relationship that we have with the Essex County Family Justice Center. Um, some of the services that the program participants receive includes the counseling. Um, we have um, case managers who meet with their program participants on a weekly basis, at least two to three times a week. Uh, we have some housing search assistance. We provide um, some children's educational programs for non-school age children in our shelter. So we have an educator from the New Jersey Education Association who comes in and provides um, learning classes and um, programs for children who are basically under four years old. Um, we also have 
is someone who does community outreach um, that she, she's dedicated to doing community outreach. So she goes into the community to provide information on domestic violences and the services we provide. We have a program advocate, a court advocate who's in the Essex County court system. And we often have that person meet with the clients in shelter prior to them going to court to kind of help guide them through the process if they want to receive a restraining order or if they want um, just information about the court system. Uh, we have a partnership with the Essex County Family Justice Center where they can get free phones if they you know, left their phone home or they, their phone was taken from them so that they can communicate with um, apartments and um, other business that they have to take care of. Um, we also offer um, programs and services through the legal system in general. We work with the Rachel Coalition, which is another nonprofit agency that serves survivors of domestic violence and they provide legal services. So um, if they don't have legal representation for their court hearings, we work with the Rachel Coalition to provide those services. Um, we also offer a, um, while they're in shelter, they obviously they receive the basic necessities, food, we provide food, clothing, we get a lot of donations of food and other items, toiletry items that they need. Um, we also provide some childcare within our program. We provide transportation services through um, one of the transportation assistants at our program, takes them to court, takes them to, if they have WIC appointments, if they have welfare appointments, or if they need to go to the police department to pick up police reports. Um, those are our services in a nutshell, but um, we, we have the ability to provide them with one-on-one -on -one conversations. We help them guide them through the process of from, from the time they come into our program to the time that they get their own apartment. They meet with their caseworkers to understand what their situation is um, and also to guide them through the process of accessing social services and other legal criminal justice um, and even financial services um, that we offer to our program participants. And the 24-hour domestic violence hotline, we get referrals from the courts, from individuals, from former residents, uh, from hospitals. Uh, because we're affiliated with the major hospital system, we also are able to get uh, medical services for the residents in our program. And we make referrals for other services that we don't offer in-house. And those run from a myriad of legal, criminal justice, financial, um, and whatever you, else you can think of, <laughs> housing, search assistance, and basically guidance in moving forward and being safe once they leave the shelter program. So those Thank are the program services in a nutshell. Thank you so much. Um, at the end of our conversation today, you will see um, information on services and a way you can support um, Safe House in a very direct, meaningful way, and also more information about Zonta. Uh, I'm an artist, I'm a visual artist, uh, I'm a poet, and what I know about art is that art heals. Art provides voice when you don't have a voice. Um, it gives you a connection to a spirit that's greater than yourself, whether it's visual art, whether it's spoken word, whether it's musical, the arts are so important and especially now. It is my great, great joy and privilege to introduce two of uh, Newark's finest um, artists, scholars, educators um, with international roots and international voice. Um, I, I think that Queen Moore, when you uh, see that beautiful picture of her, um, you begin to get a sense, not that just earth is important to her. Uh, she's a new mother. Um, she is a regular uh, artist that provides spoken word opportunities. She's published, she's a photographer. Then we have uh, Bimpe Fagiembo, who is a photo uh, journalist. She's a poet. She's a brilliant scholar, uh, published author, um, a Rutgers uh, professor. And I am incredibly richer because these women are in my 
my circle and in my life at this point. I'm going to uh, allow Queen to come forward and take the mic and then we'll be followed immediately by Bimpe and then we'll have a conversation with the artists. Enjoy the work. Thank you so much, Dr. Ellis. Good afternoon, everyone. Ladies, gentlemen, children, families, artists. Uh, my name is Queen Moore. I'm excited to be a part of this, uh, not only because I'm a woman, but because this is important at this time. We all need healing. So um, if you hear a baby crying and I have to, I'm gonna bring him on too. So I really wanna just get a poll really quickly. Um, start light and colorful, or would we like to start heavy and unload? Let's leave that to you, to you all. Heavy and unload. Heavy and unload it is, okay. I was never hungry for this type of love. I chose to devour your dysfunction because my soul laid malnourished as my tears hydrated your foolish ego. How did I let that be? You would continue to laugh at me as I would struggle to lift the spoon, to spoon out your doubts and your fears over my shoulder. You had fears of me leaving you. You would serve a dish of disaster and thought that I would remain at your table full and ready under which your feet had rested. Somehow I managed to push the plate aside and then decide that this was my last supper with you of the trouble of the trouble and the feast that you'd prepared. Oh dear universe, please watch over me. And if my bones decide to break apart through the sky as I load in, let the clouds be my wrapping, my wrapping of safety, enveloping what's left of me. In the creases of their arms, God speed my flesh before the ground is prepared for my arrival that there is a plot of the softest soil and dried dandelions and sunflowers are kept chilled for the strongest chance of survival god only knows i'm a wildflower waiting to sprout an aura of color and be ready be ready at my feet when i get there sing lullabies filled with color and dance so that i arrive home peacefully don't let them sing sad songs about me don't let those songs take over for my soul will lay stiff reflecting on my past i would tell mama I don't want to die alone, but if I must, at least let it be for a reason that I chose, not out of my control. See, women aren't given much choice to choose unless you a wild one, you know, the bucking kind, an untamed version of what all your aunts frying your mama for in the... Sorry about that. Women aren't given much choice to choose unless you are a wild one, you know, the bucking kind an untamed version of all your aunts, frying your mama forever loving your unfaithful daddy in their kitchen. Born from a grandmother designed of whiskey, profanity, and stretch marks, you can't help but to perpetuate so much history in a mason jar. Call them fireflies. When the darkness sets in inside the metal of their hearts, let their light dim or let them glow. I wanna be of the glowing kind. I can't sit at the foot of my bed, rocking my bones into comfort night after night, unsure if your return home is something I even desire or look forward to. I don't wanna be like my mother loving a man that never loved her, not desiring her kiss or to connect her freckles dot by dot as constellations in the sky. See, I have to remind myself that just in case you return smelling like lavender soap, that you never washed your face with the bar that I brought for you. See, it's still in the wrappings and the bow. How will I live with myself knowing your wrong thoughts and your wandering desires? Your knuckles no longer serve as eyelashes and eye washes and eye fixtures for my face, clouding my future. Your fingertips no longer pressing jewelry around my neck. I have to breathe for all eternity. I must give my existence a second chance. I don't want to go through life missing it, never meeting the one true love that is meant for me, experiencing our first kiss. I don't want to rob myself of that. I'm grateful I decided to leave on foot, but what if I didn't? Oh, what the world would have missed. I can't stand to see myself in a mirror that is a dirty reflection of what I should have done. God only knows. He gave me feet so that I can get up and leave. And this is my time to run. Whew. So we got done with the heavy. Um, I just really feel that poetry is a form of healing because we all need healing. And as a woman, you write all the time with or without a pen. Uh, my second piece, female human being. 
I am the female human being, still a gemstone, you know, citrine or amethyst, a lily pad of some pond, giving birth to children that aren't mine. They still require my hugs, my sweet knowledge of being the female human being. See, I charge, I charge all my internal magic to definition of learned true self, of being fly. See, I've been fly before, always with wings. I've been dope in many lifetimes before here, been dope before dope was considered a slang term. You know, a good time. I'm the woman that was a good time. And I've been evolving. I've been changing. I've been giving myself wholeheartedly to earth, letting myself sprout new leaves. And still, I have a few more galaxies to occupy during my travels. But, but for now, I came here to tear up the concrete, to burn incense and sage, to charge my stones and my crystals over a full moon ritual. I came here to raise hell and make noise, to scream and shout, to stomp my feet, to choose not to take your shh. I'm not gonna be quiet. The smell, to smell myself when I am unloved, to sing songs off key, to dance in a crowded room. I am a woman. I am what they crave. Being female doesn't make me defeated. I bleed differently and I cry outrageously. Call me the insatiable girl. When I don't do what you desire, I cramp up and kill over like cramps for the monthly. Filling myself with doubt, I am no longer bloated with fear. I am going to scream to the mountaintops that I've painted on my wall, call them mandalas, but I call them art for soul. When I don't feel as soft as I used to, my flesh becomes swollen. My face in tears and it's burning wide open. I've been crying over things out of my reach. And miles beyond my control, I am still woman. No matter what day it is or what calendar you look at, I am going to return year after year like dragonflies in your meadow. I am the risk taker, the one society places all its bets on because they know that my backbone is stronger than any steel that they can comprise in any meadow. I am the forefront. I am girl at home in the window, screaming to get outside, clean off your shelter, let me reside inside of you. I am flowers placed like gradients in your digital format. Call me girl, call me she, call me her, call me woman, call me organic produce, but know that I am the girl with flowers in her hair and a breath of fresh air. Thank you. Really quickly, I am so grateful for the honor. I just want to introduce personally the next poet, the next woman, the next love uh, that I personally know, professionally know. And Benfe is the absolute joy. To hear her speak is to be able to dance in a room and be romanticized with her words. I give you Benfe. Thank you. Am I seen? Uh, there we go. Um, Queen, I love you dearly. I love you so much and you know this. Um, so thank you for your work. Thank you. Um, hello everybody, good afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm so inspired by your work, Queen, so thank you for that. Um, this poem is called Speaker of the House. Where is your home? Who speaks from your house? whose voice is the voice of reason, and for what reason do you listen? When you intuit only half-healed and are wholly human, on this strength, where is it that you say you are going? And on whose voice are you moving forward and mountains? You know, this is why sight could only initiate but never deliver the truth. Because the lonely man looks a lot like the man alone, and I have known the voice of both. And well, how can two walk together unless they've agreed to do so? So I agree that my voice is as long as I am perfect. I agree with the voice from home so that I will be home everywhere. I agree and life you know, life, life is the agreement of this conclusion, I think. That was um, Speaker of the House. Um, if anybody is interested in that text, it is published in the spring issue of Yard Concept. Um, that's Y-A-R-D um, concept, yard-concept.com. 
It's a great publication, um, journal, and gallery, and that work is published there. Um, as Queen said, just to say quickly, that um, you know, art is healing, and part of our art as poets is the truth, right? Right. We're gatekeepers of the truth, and the truth heals. And so I'm so honored to do this. I'm so honored to have listened to my sister Queen. I'm so honored to share with all of you. This next poem is called uh, A Life and Legacy. One of the greatest gifts I've ever received from a woman is her life and her legacy. I exist as the legacy of a woman who thought herself important enough to even have one. A woman who, though she would have never said it aloud, I think believed in reincarnation, that she would return as the victory of her war. We are the victors of a war. A woman who lived like my life was her life, like she carried our names in the palms of her hands, like she didn't need to know you to know you because she knew herself. And well, if she could exist, then certainly you could too. Like what God could do once could be done twice. A woman who would never admit defeat for no other reason than the idea of calling those things that be not as though they were. A woman for whom dignity is. A woman who was always happy to see me because I am evidence that she can't die like my life is her second coming. A woman who went 12 rounds with this world for me. A woman who would fight her demons for me. A woman who would fight my demons for me. A woman who, quite frankly, would fight me for me. Do you know such a woman? Do you know of these women? There are women saving our lives, giving up theirs, walking into spaces and places not grand enough to hold their dignity, and yet they stayed so that we might build spaces and places of our own divine enough to hold our divinity. We are the legacies of women who we know and don't know, who we've read about and who history won't allow us to. The legacies of women who thought themselves important enough to even have them. And here we are. One of the greatest gifts that I've ever received from a woman is her life and her legacy. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Wow. Wow. Yes, 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 yes. Um, thank you. Thank you both so much. Thank you both so much. And so <clears throat> I wanted to begin the conversation with some themes that I heard, and I wanted to unpack. Uh, I'll say a little bit, and then you guys can respond to, um, Queen and Bimpe can respond to any of these things. And so Queen, I think you have to take your, make your voice. Uh, yes, there you go. So Queen, you began with the issue of choice mm -hmm. and the choices or the false choices that are there for women. And um, the indication that if you choose something, you are labeled a wild woman. Mm -hmm. um, and that caught me. And then, then you moved into the issue of love and the, the, the phrase love um, that your knuckles felt over your eye and uh, and then I think you, you transitioned for the, the final piece to talk about self-knowledge. How do you know yourself? Um, and you said here, burning up the concrete. You know, I, I, that, that was amazing. So I'm going to leave that for you. And then Bimpe, Speaker of the House. <laughs> um, sight couldn't deliver the truth, right? And sometimes we, right now, as we look at who's speaking truth and how do you speak truth and how does the voice know when it's telling the truth. Um, so I thought that was well done. And uh, finally, you said she would return, uh, return of her war. So we are now examples of the women that have come before and the lived lives that have gone before and, and the cycle, if you will. So uh, let, let's begin with some of those themes. And, and Queen, if you can begin to kind of um, Speak a little bit about some of those things, and then Bimpe, if you want to respond, and then um, I'm going to look to see if you're writing some questions down. We're we're keeping track of the questions, um, and uh, go ahead, Queen. So, um, 
the first one, like I said, was very, was very heavy. Um, the second, in terms of tearing up the concrete, it was more of the coming out home. You know, this is the realization and the actualization that, you know, after all, all that trauma and that life build of like damage, you know, the, you know, not having the knuckles no longer as my jewelry, that was, it's all about choice. And then I wrote in both pieces something about choice because choice is very different when you're talking about trauma and choice is very different when you learn that you no longer are attached to trauma. So you realize then like, oh God, I can choose what I want to eat. I can choose what I want to wear. I can choose how I want to do my hair. And like those little things to certain people may be little things, but for people that are in bondage and in trauma, those are very big things. Like I wasn't allowed to do my hair in a certain hairstyle when I was living a traumatic life. I wasn't allowed to wear lipstick or, you know, have my nails done with a color or even be this, you know, tenacious. I was very much this big and I didn't know that I could be like in this moment, even with all you ladies. So to understand like, you know, tearing up the concrete, that's like when I realized what outside smelled like, it was like Avatar when Jake Sully finally busted out when he got into his <laughs> yeah, Avatar. Yeah, yeah. Like, my feet are in the soil, like outside smells like this, I'm gone. I'm out of here. So, and that's, that's, that's the beauty of it. being able to know that your, tr your trauma is momentary. If you mm. live in that moment and you're just like, okay, what do I do now? So, yeah. Wow. Wow. Bimpe, any of the themes that you want to address before we open it up for a conversation with everyone? Sure. I mean, uh, just to speak to your questions, um, I think that, um, you know, as far as sight delivering truth, um, it can't, right? Um, what you see is not necessarily, uh, is, is, doesn't have to be the truth. It could be a reflection of, of a time, but um, not necessarily the truth. I mean, somebody can look in the mirror and see nothing, see no one of value. Mm. That's not true, right? Mm. You, ha you have a purpose, right? And, and your purpose is valuable to the world. So imagine if you just thought you saw yourself and, and you said to yourself, well, I have no, I have no purpose, but you absolutely do. So, you know, and, and that's in all facets of, of sight and, and truth. Um, only truth can deliver truth. Um, and uh, as far as the second poem, uh, yeah, as being legacies of, of women, I, I am the legacy, you know, I had my grandmother in mind when I, when I wrote that. And mm, I say a little bit about grandma. My grandmother, man, she was a fighter. <laughs> and, and I think it's easy to talk about um, women that, you know, are fighters in that way. But in, in a lot of ways, all women, I'm the legacy of plenty of women, the ones who didn't fight for me and the ones that fought for me and didn't know they were. Mm. And so, um, and I think about the legacy that I will live um, or that I, I will leave behind. And, and I hope to leave a legacy of, of truth and, and living a truthful life, not living a shadow of who I'm supposed to be, but who I actually am and who, you know, who I'm purpose to be. So um, I think that's really important. Yeah. It's good. I'm, I'm seeing some folks talk about um, the connection to their own mother, um, which can be good and it can also be bad, right? And, I, and uh, Queen, when you, when you say that now you are free, um, you think that um, people in trauma can just leave it quickly? I, you know, I don't want us to think that. I mean, how do we, how do we work through that? I mean, it took me all of 24 years to finally leave. It took me that long to realize I can walk outside my door despite, you know, um, what my, uh, how, what can we call him? What he would say, we'll say, we'll call him he, because I've moved out of calling him out of his name. Um, um, my father, we'll put it like that. Um, mommy hands. <laughs> um, the feeling of knowing that I'm no longer attached to that trauma was even still unreal. Like, I felt like me leaving was me doing something bad. I felt like me talking about it with other people was me cursing my family and you know bringing shame and harm on them so I figured that I would go to another state and you know change my whole identity and, and throw myself away you know and put myself in a corner pretty much 
I never understood that what I was going through was trauma. I felt like, okay, somebody else, you know, it's not safe to tell anybody else outside of my home because nobody's ever going to believe me. So trauma has so many, like, woven dynamics to it that you have to really unweave the mat. You know, it's a real unweaving of the mat of trouble and hurt and pain and all of that because you're always going to put yourself last and how what you've been made to feel and be put through is affecting everyone else but yourself. You always see yourself last, from my experience. (laughs) Trauma is not immediate to get to release yourself from. It takes navigation. It takes... It takes time. Yeah. Yeah. Bimpe, uh, is there something that you want to respond to Queen and vice versa regarding the pieces, um, either the process or or anything? So um, poet to poet, um, sister to sister, yeah. um, Nigeria to Haiti. <laughs> um, talk to me. Yeah. I mean, just to add to what Queen said about you know, how trauma is is not immediate. So many things um, that we need are not immediate, right? So whether healing is not immediate, that, that's a process. Forgiveness is not immediate. Um, I mean, there are times where I've thought, where I thought I've forgiven someone, right? Just to find out something happens and I just realized that that forgiveness that I thought that I, that, that I had, you know, resolved a month ago, I haven't, right? So forgiveness takes time and all of those things take time. And in order to even get there, like Queen, you know, you tell your story, it's, and kind of knowing how far you've come is beautiful and I love you dearly. And um, there's a level of self-awareness that you, that you need in order to even get to that point, right? Um, Or at least I think so. And uh, the minute that you, are sick and tired, right? And it's not easy, but um, when you resolve in your heart and your spirit to make that move, you do. And, mm. um, and that's a process. You know, one week you, you, you think you're healed, you think you're good, and then just to realize you're not. And so it is a process. And understanding that I think helps you not to beat up on yourself in, in, in the process of, of getting there. Um, so just to add to what Um, So as I'm looking here, uh, the issue of forgiveness came up and and people are echoing that. Uh, It's hard to forgive ourselves, right? And I think that becomes um, the center of of the work um, and to let go. And it is a process. Some days you're doing better than other days. Um, And so while everybody's been confined and locked in these spaces, What's going on? What, what, what do you think, um, how, how is poetry and, and how do you find voice when you, you are really, the walls may be coming in on you or, you know, um, behavior that you took for granted, the touch of somebody uh, is now something that's, that's not permitted. Um, and I, I want us to maybe open up a little bit to, to um, folks. So if you have a question and you want to uh, unmute yourself, uh, or uh, something that has triggered some thought, we invite you to do that. Because the idea of this is that we are in a community, that you're not alone, you're not isolated, and uh, we want to work together. Um, I'd like to open okay. um, something. Um, I think during this time, it, was, it has been even for a poet, um, as Bempe was saying, like we use our experiences to like really take a moment to reflect. But I think with all of us being home, um, everyone, everybody wants you to be, get everything on your to-do list done, all your bucket list stuff done. And then you have people that are not able to tap into that. So for instance, I host several open mics in Newark during the calendar year, which have been canceled um, among many other things. And a lot of people have been texting me like, sis, I miss your show. I miss the opportunity to be able to speak. That In that moment, um, I, a sister friend of mine, an elder said to me, if you ever want the truth, ask a poet. And when people are not able to access the arts and their platforms to be able to talk about something that may be killing them and that element of poetry, 
a lot, everybody isn't able to heal during this time frame. A lot of people are suffering. And I feel like what we do as artists is a sense of vulnerability. There's a sense of uh, being able to tap into something that's bigger than yourself. Um, even being in this moment with all of you right now is a moment for me to like, okay, my open mic isn't canceled. I still have a fulfillment of self. I still am fulfilling a purpose. So I think that if we spend less time being so tough on ourselves, even with all this unoccupied time, being with yourself in this moment doesn't require you to do anything but just be. So I just wanted to say that in terms of time. Thank you. Uh, Winnie, I saw your hand up. Um, Me? Yes. No, I had um, tried to um, send a, um, a comment uh, when we were talking, uh, we were talking about um, forgiveness and everything, and it brought um, to mind um, the words of T.D. Jakes, and one of the things in uh, his book, Let Go, is that um, forgiveness takes a jet, and that, you know, we can forgive someone for what they've done or something to forgive ourselves, but trust takes a bus. And if you think about it, it means you can forgive someone, say, hey, I forgive you for that. But how long does it take you to trust that person or yourself in that situation again, or in the situation like that again? That, I, I think that's a, a, a great point. And I think that there is no time limit. Um, I think that it is uh, something that is almost like a rubber band, right? You stretch it out, you hope it's going, and sometimes it comes back. Uh, and if you're really needing dough, you know, you know that if you overwork the dough, it's just going to keep doing some things. And you're, and, and so it, it is a process. I see a, a great question as, you know, I'm a mother of two sons. I'm a sister with four brothers. Um, my life has been informed by male energy, by boys, by men. Um, I tried out for the football team or I went down to try for the football team. It didn't didn't happen. And so uh, many times I think we leave boys out of these conversations uh, and we put the burden sometimes on women. And I, I think that with the work has to happen parallel where boys have to be taught um, that their voice is important uh, and not to abuse the power that patriarchy puts on, uh, gives them. And I think that sometimes in our, in our unpacking, uh, sometimes we don't think about the boys and we don't necessarily know how to do that. And I don't want to call on Hanifa Barnes, but uh, I'm calling on Hanifa Barnes <laughs> um, to, to maybe respond a little bit to some of, of some of this. I don't know if we can, we can't hear her. Okay. Can you hear you me? Yes. Oh, Go wow. Ahead. I'm totally on the spot. <laughs> um, I did have a separate question to the work, but when well, it, Whatever we want to do. Okay, okay. But your point, Antoinette, about boys being, um, I would say, embraced in our experiences, our being women, yeah. um, is important. I have three boys myself. And, you know, I've really tried my best to figure out how to allow them kind of a window and also their own door to step into mm. what I am going through. And that requires a lot of honest conversation and not calling myself a superhero or superwoman because I don't believe in that narrative. Right. Um, and so when I'm hurting, I need them to know that. If I'm crying, I've learned to come out of the corner and allow them to see that. Mm. And so, um, and I learned some of that in teaching boys, yeah. you know, because boys are very different students than girls. And, you know, you learn a lot about who they are and their experiences. And I could take that into raising my own boys. So that's to that point. It's, it's a very important point. Um, to uh, my question about the work to Queen on your first piece, um, the word choice was just so interesting to me like I got a sense in my listening that you were talking about an experience of abuse but I heard words like there was a line about the fingers and the jewelry 
And it's almost deceiving at first because it's endearing. When you talk about fingers and jewelry, you're like, this is a gift. And so in one sense, I felt like whoever your abuser was, was trying to ask for forgiveness or being contrite. But then at the same time, you say something about pressing the jewelry or something mm -hmm. where there was a force on your neck. So then immediately I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, this person is hurting you. But the way you use the words, you know, uh, I thought it was very interest, interesting because it's a delicate dance between, you know, this idea of forgiveness and contrition, but then also this force and this violence. So how did you do that? What were you thinking? I mean, you know, I just kind of want to hear about that. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, I was having a conversation with Benfe yesterday and with my cousin this morning that uh, everybody's been asking me to write my memoir about my life, like what has happened. And I said, you know, because I've moved from the victim standpoint to the victor, I don't want to write something that is just so withdrawing. Like it was so much that I went through over a significant amount of years and to unpack that after I've moved forward would be, I think, detrimental. So in terms of the jewelry comment, um, I referred to it in another piece called Hush Gifts Given. And those were to keep you quiet. So that jewelry was relative to um, yeah. wow. this, you be quiet, but it also became the weapon. It came in between the weapon, you know, and that's how it was pressed into my skin. Like, you know, you bought me this necklace. Now you're using it as a part of the use of the attack, or you bought me this computer to do my homework, but you're using it now to against me. Uh, or you won't help me buy my school books for college unless I do X, Y, and Z. So it became tools of force or tools of their nature. So. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and I think that to unpack that, and somebody else was asking a question regarding process. Do they find your work incredibly uh, inspirational, both of you? Are you coming to the work in the, it, sitting in the pain? Is it a aha moment? Or are you coming and approaching the work from inspiration? I mean, how does your process work? And maybe Bimpe, you could start and then Queen uh, follow up. Sure. Um, I write stream of consciousness. And um, that is, you know, that is when I, I write at the rate in which I think. So I, while I'm thinking, I'm writing, which is why I prefer to maybe write on a laptop or grab my phone quickly because I know that my hand cannot keep up with my thoughts. So, um, and I don't know if it comes, I, I believe it comes off that way when, you know, when I recite, but it's really just conversations. I'm writing down conversations that I'm having with myself. And um, so I feel very fortunate to be able to capture that um, as it happens. And then as far as inspiration, it's, it's life. It's, introspection it's you know um it's what i'm thinking whether it's a simple phrase um you know i'll think uh deeply about uh just mundane phrases it happens to the best of us you know i mm. um about whether there is a best of us right like what does that mean when we say that um uh so you know the inspiration is is, is life is what happens to all of us it's my grandmother right or somebody else's grandmother it's um you know the what what will happen after you know we get off this call it's it's the feeling that i get from all of you it's a question that somebody asked me it was uh, maybe thinking a little deeper into a response that i gave and so i'll write that as i'm thinking it and so that's my process okay thank you uh then after if queen you don't necessarily have to respond we also hear that uh Aisha has a question or thought, comment to add to our conversation. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hello. Um, Hello. Thank you so much, Queen of Bimpe. This, this is amazing. It's really amazing. And um, one of the things that I was thinking of is um, what was your journey to getting to poetry as a way to find your voice? Because I know when people are going through something, sometimes they have I have all of this in me and I'm not sure how to get it out. How did you find that this is how I get it out? This is how I, you know, express myself. This is how I work through what I'm going through. And this is how I give my voice to the world. 
just curious about your process of getting to that point. Thank you. Uh, uh, Queen? Um, I come from a family of artists. My grandmother was a writer. Uh, my father was a writer. Uh, poets, let's be clear. Poets and storytellers, griots. Um, but I wrote a very different type of poetry when I was home in my trauma. I wrote a very uh, thematic uh, type of poetry that um, I knew would appeal to other people. Um, I would even write in my diary um, what I knew my father would read. He would open my diary and read it. So I would prepare to write what he would want to read in my mind. That's how I started writing. And then after I left my trauma, I said, you know what, this is my style of writing. I need to craft it. I need to figure it out. I need to hear it in my head. Um, Bempe and I spoke about cadence and you know how that I hear it in my head and the pieces that I wrote, they were not written pieces. Um, I performed freestyle poetry and it then has to be transcribed after I listen to it. So then it becomes edited. So I hear it in my head, I spit it on sight, and then I go back after I record it and I listen to it and then I write it down and then I make my edits. So um, and, and wrapping of that, like I have to live in that moment. The, the poem is not thought out previously. Um, it takes an experience to attach to a thought and then at three in the morning, here comes thought. So that's pretty much how that, how that comes about. I, I have a, a question or thought for anyone who's here. How are you um, dealing with isolation? Um, and how are you dealing with uh, limits that are imposed upon you at this particular uh, time? And um, so uh, transparency, I'm a professor, so I tend to use that, um, that style. Um, and just to go back a little bit, um, Hanifa Barnes, uh, was the teacher to my son. So uh, I think greatly and, and highly of her. But anybody, how, how are you dealing with isolation? I, I know for one, my mother who has um, lymphoma and leukemia, um, she lives uh, alone, but she lives around the corner from my brother. Um, I, I don't go over there. Um, while she goes over to see my brother, I'm very conscious of um, that circle, uh, Bimpe, that you talk about. Um, and I think for her though, she, she wants me to come in. And so here I am, I'm kind of feeling a little conflicted, um, derelict as a daughter, um, but in my ways trying to be uh, protective. And, and her, her you know, Jamaican point is, you know, nothing's gonna bother me. So I, I'm, I'm still walking that line. And you know, I, I, sometimes I think, well, am I the only daughter that might be feeling this kind of thing? So. Um, maybe if you want to raise your hand or if you have a thought about it, um, I would welcome it. Oh, oh I see. Okay, Teresa. Yes. Teresa? Teresa Perry. You have to unmute yourself or... The bottom left. Can she unmute herself? Bottom left. Bottom left, unmute yourself. Got it? Yeah, I was okay, having difficulty getting. Well, when you talk about, I like what you said about your mother's going out, but then you're not going out. My children won't come to see me mm. because I have some underlying issues. However, twice a week, I put on my mask and my gloves and I go to a food bank because I feel like that's something that I have to do. I want, I want to do, I need to do. And very conscious of most of the things that they say that people like me shouldn't, you know, shouldn't do and I try not to do because I'm over 65. I have uh, insulin dependent diabetes. I have high blood pressure. I'm obese, all those things. But I pray to be protected and I don't go any place else, but I feel as though that's the part of me that needs to go and make sure that the food is ready for people to collect once a week. So, but my daughters, if they have to bring something, they bring it, they drop it and they let it go. They didn't come for my birthday. They did it on Zoom. So I'm like torn betwixt and between self-quarantining myself, except for when I need to go to the food bank. And, and you just said something about women and about uh, what we do 
Um, and I don't think we can do it all. I don't want us to do it all, but there is a cultural and spiritual urgency, I think, at this moment. Um, I, I'm going to, you know, thank you guys so much for, for coming and for sharing and for being vulnerable. Thank you, Queen. Um, I have so much respect for you. Um, and to be able to be this transparent and this open um, with all of us is healing for us as a community and also as an individual. And, and uh, Bimpe, your words is what, are what made me think of my mother and the, the circle and the, the legacy and the responsibility and the love that um, joins us. And I thank you for that. I thank you for your, your daughter, uh, granddaughter spirit. It's really important. And so next week on Saturday um, uh, at two to three o'clock, we are going to have uh, an interactive workshop with writing. So today we, we hear the writers and the poets and I am so excited. Bethany, we have our own Dr. Uh, Linda Epps, um, scholar, uh, writer, um, who will participate in facilitating our uh, responses in writing. And I am over the moon um, that we have Jasmine Mann, who is a noted uh, storyteller, poet, who performs across the world. Uh, and to have this intergenerational uh, conversation. And we will take a break for the 16th. I know the weather is going to be great, but we'll have one more um, opportunity to engage. Uh, I said earlier, I'm a visual artist and Daniel Scott, who is a mixed media phenomenal artist, right? Those of us who know and have seen her work, it is powerful. Uh, she will um, walk us through some things. So the next time that we meet, we will talk about what supplies you might need to have uh, as we are observing and participating. Um, but I thank you very much for, for being here. I thank uh, NJ Pack for um, the platform and for this opportunity. Uh, you've heard about Zantas. Uh, hopefully you will see something on the screen that, that tells you uh, about the organization. If not, go online. We'll continue to talk about it. Um, and we welcome, we welcome you. I'm going to throw it back to uh, Sarah, um, who has been a great partner, great sister in this uh, venture, who will uh, close us out. So thank you very much. Well, I just want to say thank you to Dr. Antoinette Ellis Williams. I mean, we, when she joined our trustees of the Women at NJPAC board, we, uh, we asked her to help create connections for us and to build our community of women. Uh, and we couldn't have asked for anybody better to help help us at this time to bring ourselves together. So we hope this is just the start of building a community of women as we work together using art to heal ourselves through this time. And so I just want to say thank you to her. I want to say thank you to Queen and Ben Bay. Uh, I want to say thank you to Del Rina and Safe House and the work you're doing to protect women and take care of women in our community. And, um, and we hope that you will be back with us. Uh, we hope you will continue to follow us. We do have some resources, um, both this is how you get in touch with Del Rina and um, uh, we, NJPAC has a strong partnership with the Mental Health Association of Essex and Morris. So um, we, we wanted to make these available to you. We have recorded this conversation. So we're gonna be putting it on our website. So if there's anybody, uh, you can go back and look at it. You can share it with somebody um, and we, um, we do hope that you uh, continue to uh, be well, take care of yourselves and your families, and, um, and we'll see you again. And what I would say is, why doesn't everybody unmute and um, say goodbye or say hello and, um, as, we, as we complete our gathering here. So thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Thank you. Oh, before, before, oh, go. Oh, I wanted our committee members to uh, say hello. So we have Garth, I think. We have Alicia here. We have Alicia. We have Lisa.
Um, thank you, and we also and we also say be well. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Good job. Good job. Good job, everybody. Bye. What I tell. So Queen, I love that you have your <laughs> little baby there. It's just so they can, like, lose their jobs. Mm -hmm. And now, Look. So I guess, uh, Christine, thank you for everything. Queen, thank you for everything. Del Reno, that was wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, Bempe, thank you. it was really uh, terrific. What a, what a great way to start something that, you know, Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Out of nothing, really. So. Uh, just thank you. He woke up right on time. Say hi. hi. Oh. <laughs> oh, I love the little onesie. Oh, so cute. <laughs> Earlier, it dried right in time. <laughs> you miss that? Yeah. Oh. oh, I love it. <laughs>